out and they go to this gas station in Slainsville and Belinda gets out, she's fueling up her car and another resident of Slainsville pulls up right next to her and she's filling up her car. And the two women strike up a conversation. At some point in this discussion, the woman asks Belinda where she lives in Slainsville because she's a longtime resident and she didn't recognize Belinda. Belinda describes where she lives and the woman who's familiar with the area says, well, do you know the story of your property? And Belinda's like, no. She's like, well, years and years ago, there was a really bad fire. I think it was right near your property that a whole family died in. And Belinda says, you know what? I actually found a small cemetery a little ways back on our property, but that's what it is. As Belinda is driving away and she's thinking about the story she's been told, she has this sense of relief that now she has some closure on why there's that cemetery on her property. And she couldn't help but think if her house is haunted, which she had only recently considered, Maybe it's not such a bad thing to have it be this family that's doing the haunting. It didn't feel evil, it just felt kind of sad, and she was empathetic for this lost family. When they got back from running those errands, Coco was gone. They went to the fence and it hadn't been opened. There was no sign that she'd been able to burrow underneath this fence. There was no way for her to get out unless you opened the gate, and it was locked and shut. And so they didn't know what to make of that. And the only thing they could come up with is someone must have taken Coco. And unfortunately, they would never see Coco again. It was a huge loss for this family. Coco was not only a dog they loved and considered part of their family, but she was also their protection. And it was, it was a very big deal that she was gone. A couple of days go by and Brian's home from work and everyone in the house is asleep except for Belinda. Belinda was up watching TV. And at some point she turns off the TV and she also goes to bed. She starts having the same dream she had when she felt that clothespin on her toe. In her dream, she wakes up and at the foot of her bed is this boy, the same boy that she had followed outside that she could never find in the sheets. And so she gets up and, and she starts following this boy. He brings her out to the front of the house, out onto the front yard. And again, the whole front yard is covered in these white sheets that are strung up along clotheslines. And as she's making her way across the front yard, pulling sheets aside, she finally reaches a clearing and she sees this boy who looks like about the same age as her son, Sean. And this boy looks terrified and she's looking at him and the boy is kind of looking to his left. And then from behind one of the sheets next to the boy, walks this dark figure that stands right next to him and looks up at her. And it's an expressionless dark figure. It almost looks like a man. And it starts walking up the lane of sheets towards her. She falls over backwards and she wakes up. And when she wakes up in real life, she hears screaming coming from her own son's room. She and Brian jump up out of bed and run into Sean's room. He's laying on the ground with his arm cocked to the side. It's clearly been broken. And he's screaming and guarding his arm. And Belinda's over him saying, what happened? What happened? And the boy just says, the monster came in the window. They don't know what to make of this. They're not sure if that means an intruder came in or what, but they have to get him to the hospital. They scoop him up, they grab Blair and they get in the car and they leave. They get Sean to the hospital and sure enough, he's got a very bad break in his arm and he needs to stay at the hospital for a couple of days. Now this happened on a Sunday night and so Brian had to go back to Maryland the next day for work. So their car was gone. So three days later when it was time to get Sean, Belinda had to borrow her mother's car to go pick him up. So Belinda gets her mother's car and she and Blair drive to the hospital. They pick up Sean. As they're driving back, the car breaks down and they're on the side of the road with flashers on and Belinda doesn't know what to do. Luckily, a good Samaritan is driving by. Another resident of Slainsville sees them pulled over. She pulls over, it's an older woman, and she says, hey, can I give you guys a ride? Belinda's like, thank you, yes, we need a ride. So she, Sean, and Blair load up in the car and they start driving to their house. And so Belinda tells this woman where she lives. Yep, you take this road, you get up to our house and sit back in the woods there. And when she realizes where Belinda lives, she looks at Belinda and goes, you do know the history of your house, right? And Belinda looks at her and goes, yeah, the, the fire that, that, that killed the family, we're aware. She goes, no, not a fire. The last occupant of your house was rumored to be hurting children on your property. And there's no proof, but some of the local men here decided they were gonna take justice into their own hands and they convinced this guy to go hunting with them. And they brought him out in the woods behind his house and they ambushed him and his body's never been found. It's rumored there's a van somewhere in the woods near your house where they put him inside of it, shut the doors and lit it on fire. Belinda's in shock hearing this because now if her house is haunted, which she's believing it is, it's not some nice family that was sadly lost in a fire. It's this horrible man. 
They finally got back to the house. They said bye to the woman and Belinda and her kids went inside. And for Belinda, it was like this horrible sense of dread being in the house. It just felt evil. And she realized that she couldn't stay there anymore. So she picks up the phone, she calls Brian and she says, I cannot stay here another night. I have to go. And so Brian says, okay. He drives back from Maryland. They pack some bags, they get in his car and they all leave for Brian's mom's house. And that was it. They never stayed another night at that house. They only went back a couple times to pack up their stuff, put it in moving trucks and they left. <music>